Hello, everybody. So let's jump into an amazing, wonderful, fantastic finance flash card video where what we're going to do is this. We're basically going to get ourselves to a point where we're going to get familiar with a handful of finance terms today. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about each one. So we have our first one up on the screen. I'm going to give you a textbook definition, and then I'm going to kind of break it down for you and give you a little bit more information. And what I want you to do is we have a huge push this upcoming year to hit 100,000 subscribers. So if you can, please do hit that subscribe button, hit like. It really does help us out over here on the channel. Um, I'm a one-man show, so I really do appreciate all your support because that supports me and that helps me keep going and it motivates me to help all of you pass your exams. So let's look at this first one. It is a conventional mortgage. So. A lot of you, a lot of you have this definition of a conventional mortgage where you say this is a normal mortgage. This is the, this is the, the norm, the, the vanilla ice cream of mortgages. And you're not incorrect in saying that, but let's get a little more specific about how we would define this. So the textbook definition says that it's originated by banks and private financial institutions. They are not government-backed or insured. Listen, everyone in the back, listen to what I'm going to tell you in the nosebleed section. If it is not government-backed, so it's not FHA, USDA, VA, any government-backed institution, it is conventional. It is considered to be a conventional loan. Now, another misnomer or common misconception about conventional loans is that you got to put 20% down. You got you to put 20% down. You don't have to put 20% down, but if you don't, you're going to be required to pay what's called PMI or private mortgage insurance. So it's a situation where, and you have to keep that in mind, the 20% down is not something that is required. There are programs out there for conventional loans where you could basically get yourself to a point where you're paying you know, 10%, some as low as 5% down. So there's some great, crazy programs out there, but you would be paying PMI. Now, Stu, what if... What if we get equity in our home after a year to two years? Is this something that could be taken off and removed? Absolutely. Absolutely. So basically what they're going to do is they're going to check to see that basically the value of the home has increased enough that the loan on it, the loan is 80% of the value or lower. So whatever the outstanding principal balance is, is it 80% or lower? So it looks like you made a 20% down payment based on the value that it's currently at. Does that make sense? I hope that does. If you have any questions, please do comment down below. I'd be more than happy to clarify or give you some help on that. So that is a conventional loan. Our next word is going to be amortized. Amortized. So when something is amortized, the payments are going to be equal each payment period, and they include increasing increments of principal payments, which retire the loan balance over the term of the loan. That is a lot of words there. So, Stu, can we make it really simple? Sure. Characteristics of amortized. And we can have partially amortized or fully amortized. The root word for this it also has to do with mortgage, too. So in Latin, morte is death. So what happens is amortized means that it's basically you're slowly killing off the loan. And if you're partially slowly killing off the loan, it will be partially amortized. And if you're fully killing it off, it will be fully amortized. Now, the part that you're probably confused with is the increasing increments of principal payments which retire the loan. Now, this is something that's interesting, and I wanted to go over this with conventional, with, uh, excuse me, amortized loans. So amortized loans, uh, the most amount, so each payment is equal, okay? Each payment is equal, and I'm going to show you on the next screen what I mean, okay? Each payment is equal. So let's just say for argument's sake, to make this nice and easy, it's a $1,000 payment per month, 
okay? It's a $1,000 payment per month. And what happens is this. Let's say on the first payment, okay, so you just took out the, the mortgage. You had just purchased your home. You're in your honeymoon phase. You love it. You haven't figured out all the things that are wrong with the home yet. It's a beautiful thing. So what happens is your very first payment is going to be $1,000 a month. Guess what? Your very last payment on an advertised loan is going to be $1,000 a month. But the difference is going to be this. There's a percentage that goes towards principal, and there's a percentage that goes towards interest. On your very first payment, the most amount of that $1,000 would go towards interest. So it won't be paying off that loan almost at all. That's actually why some people actually send in additional payments throughout the years. So if your parents, your loved ones, your friends or family say, hey, send in additional payments, the reason why they say that is because that goes straight to principal. So if you put $1,000, $2,000, $3,000, and it's outside your regularly planned or regularly scheduled payments, what happens is that all goes to paying down the principal. So you could shave some years off of an amortized loan like that. So basically, if you look at this, I'm explaining that in the first payment, $700 would go towards interest. 300 towards principal, okay? And then it's a situation where at the end of the loan, it's basically going to be totally inverse almost, where all most of the payment is going to go towards principal and only a small sliver of it's going to go towards interest. So why is that? Why do they do that? Well, that's to ensure that over the life of the loan that if you sell it like within five years, six years, because that's usually about like the average, then what happens is this, you're going to be making sure that the bank is paid. The bank makes sure that they are paid. That's why, as I said, in an amortized loan, the highest amount that goes towards interest would be on that very first payment. And the least amount would be on the very last one, as I give you in this crude little simple example. So let's take a look at the next one. The next one is a fixed rate loan. A fixed rate loan. So what is a fixed rate loan? Well, that's one where the interest rate doesn't fluctuate or change over the term of the loan. So if it's a 30-year loan, as if it's a 15-year loan, and it's fixed rate, whatever that interest rate is that you lock in at the time that you originate or take out the loan, it's going to be the same throughout the life of the loan. So whether it be 15 years, 16 years, 30 years, whatever the case may be, it's going to be a situation where that interest rate will not change. They call that a fixed rate loan. Next one is a package mortgage. So how I remember this is going to be this. We package our knickknacks, right? If I'm packing up my home, I package my knickknacks, my things, my personal items. So package mortgages are going to be mortgage loans, which also finance articles of personal property. So, Stu, when would this be something that we would actually see in real life? Like, what is a good example of when someone would take out a package loan? Well, I'm glad you asked. So, the time that you would be taking out a package loan, typically, like, imagine if you uh, bought a vacation rental and maybe it was fully furnished and the furniture was, you know, fairly expensive. Or maybe it wasn't even, like, Expensive, it was just a bigger chunk of change than you were hoping to pay for furniture, like 30000 maybe 15000 You could actually roll that into a package mortgage where you could basically purchase something like a furnished property like that. So mortgages that are going to be including articles of personal property, those are going to be called package mortgages. Package mortgages. Next term that you might hear is leverage. So we usually hear this in investing, okay? So whenever someone's talking about leverage, you're basically talking about using borrowed capital for the purposes of anticipated profits. Oh man, that's a mouthful. So let's break it down into layman's terms. Basically, let's say I have a million dollars in the bank, okay? I'm I'm, I'm money bag stew. <laughs> So what happens is this, I have a million bucks in the bank and I want to buy a property, okay? But I decide that I won't, I won't touch my million dollars because I want to keep it there for a rainy day, okay? So then what happens is this, I would take out a loan, which is me 
leveraging borrowed capital, leveraging that for the purposes of anticipated profits. Basically, I'm like, hey, you know what? This is a good investment. This is something that's going to be amazing, fantastic, wonderful. I'm going to borrow money instead of using my own funds. Okay. So leverage is when you're using borrowed funds basically to hopefully make money. Okay. So next one is supply and demand. So a lot of you get confused with supply and demand. You're, you're not really understanding, uh, you know, which way is up and how it affects one if supply goes up or demand goes up or they both go up and then they both go down. Stu, fix it for us. Fix it in our head. And remember, if you haven't already hit that like button, please hit subscribe again. It's something that really helps me, especially in this push that I'm having right now where I'm looking to get to 100,000 subscribers. It's really going to help me out. So I appreciate that. Just want to take five seconds out to remind you again if you haven't already. So this one says the amount of a commodity in relationship to its desires to assess value. Holy banana rama. So supply and demand, what is that? It's basically calculating how much of a stuff we have versus how much of a demand there is for it, okay? So now here's the thing, and I like using toilet paper at the beginning of the uh, pandemic. I, I like using that as an example because I think it's something we could all wrap our head around, right? So prior to that, prior to March 2020, there's a situation where, hey, we were coasting along. You know, I was wiping my tuchus with Charmin 4-ply, not a problem. We were happy and wonderful. And then all of a sudden, March 2020 hits, and guess what? I'm now begging, begging for a roll of Scott's, like, sandpaper at the, at the gas station, and I'm paying $20 a roll, okay? So what happened there? What happened? Well, the supply drastically drops. If you drop the supply of almost anything, almost anything, even if it has just a normal demand, supply drops, then what happens is the price is going to go up, okay? Now, conversely, also, too, guess what? We keep the supply at the same OK, and then if demand all of a sudden shoots up and increases, that's another way the prices would increase. OK, so whenever the demand outweighs the supply, whether it's because the supply has shrunk or the supply has stayed stagnant and the demand has just increased. So think of it. Look at a seesaw. You ready? Supply on the left hand side. So so hold your two hands out. OK, I'm doing this with you. OK, hold your two hands out on the left is supply. On the right is demand, okay? So if we drop the supply, so we're dropping our left hand and demand goes up, then what happens is it's a situation where we're going to have higher prices, right? Let's put them level again, okay? Supply and demand. Then watch this. Instead of dropping your left hand, let's just raise our right hand. What do we have? We have something that looks exactly the same. So any time demand outweighs the supply, whether it's because supply has dropped or demand has increased, we have an increase in value, the increase in the amount that you're going to be paying for something. That works on the real estate market. That works in the video game market. That works in the comic book market. That works on so many different levels that change your commodity out with any type of widget and you're going to get to a point where you're going to say, okay, yeah, this makes sense. If the demand outweighs the supply, price goes up, okay? And then conversely, if we have too much of something and the demand goes down or the demand stays stagnant and we have flood the market with something, guess what? It's a situation where prices would go down. Things would be on sale, okay? Not a lot of people are looking for it. Makes sense? Hopefully it does. Next one is an adjustable rate mortgage. Hey, we did fixed rate. Now we're going to do adjustable rate. Why? Because why not? So the interest rate will fluctuate according to a market index during the term of the loan. So layman's terms, okay, what does that mean? Uh, it just means that the interest rate is going to change, okay? The interest rate is going to change. That's absolutely 100% all it means. The interest rate will 
change during the term loan. Good, bad, indifferent. Okay. And hey, will your payments sometimes increase? Absolutely. Will they sometimes decrease if the interest rate goes down? Sure, absolutely. So it's going to be a situation where it will fluctuate as opposed to a fixed rate loan, as opposed to a fixed rate loan. Next one is a mortgage. Listen, listen, I'm going to say this. Write this down. I want you writing this down. Pause the video. I don't care. The money is not the mortgage. Okay? Okay? The money is not the mortgage. So let me tell you where people get mixed up. Because we have a saying. We usually say this in um, in passing in layman's terms. We usually say, I'm going to get a mortgage. Nay, nay, you're not going to get a mortgage. You're getting a loan, and then you're going to actually technically be giving the bank a mortgage. So uh, uh, please take a little detour with me because I'm going to explain something, and I'm going to explain where we, we're probably the best example of a mortgage, understanding of a mortgage is. Okay? So who here has played Monopoly? Right? I love that game. One of my favorite games in the world. I have a strategy, too. I could almost win every single time, but I digress. In Monopoly, when we mortgage a property, we mortgage it and then take the money. We don't ever take the money and say, this is the mortgage. Think about that. Think about that verbiage that we use. Why? Because Monopoly is actually a better teacher and instructor of real estate than you actually even think. Okay, so what happens is this. We mortgage it and take the money. So what happens is the mortgage is the pledge of the real property as collateral for repayment of the loan. The mortgage is a document that is given to the lender. It secures the loan. It secures the loan. So remember, repeat after me, the money is not the mortgage. The money is not the mortgage. Do not think of the money as a mortgage. Okay? Bad. Naughty. It's why the mortgagor is the borrower. Well, and guess what? That might be one of our words we talk about today. Next one. We have a couple more. This one is a lien. So what is a lien? So some of you know my good friend Joe over at Prep Agent, and he always says lien money, lien money. Yeah, a lien is a financial claim against a property to repay a debt right? It's basically going to be something that is placed on a property so that if you don't pay them back, they can come and take the property, okay? So a lien is a financial claim against the property. A lien is an encumbrance. Remember this, though. A lien is an encumbrance, but not all encumbrances are liens, right? Right? An in, in encumbrance is a a claim, a claim or burden against the property. So it could be a financial claim like this one. It could be a physical burden, a usage burden, like an easement, something like that. It could be an encroachment where there's a physical, uh, there's a physical structure that's crossing over the property line. It could be any of those, any of those. So that's what an encumbrance is. But remember, not all encumbrances are liens because they could be those other things that we just mentioned. Next one, and the last one for this video, is mortgager. Mortgager. So we already said who's the mortgager. Because remember, the OR gives the EE receive. So we know what a mortgage is. And if we know who's giving the mortgage, that's the borrower. And if we know that the borrower is giving the mortgage, then we also know that the one who's receiving it, the mortgagee, is going to be the bank. Right? Because the OR gives, EE receives. So that's the situation with that. So that's going to wrap up this video. I hope you liked it. If you do, hit that like button, please, and hit subscribe. I am shooting for 100,000, and I will not keep saying, I will not stop saying it till I hit it. And that's going to be where I'm going to say thank you to everyone. And again, I do say in the interim on my journey there, Thank you, thank you, thank you. And if you have any questions, please feel free to type it down below. Also, if you haven't noticed, I have helped me find a brokerage of math with Stu. If you want to get my free guides on either one of those sites, go ahead, check them out, and I will see you all real soon.